Hello, this is Amanda Malave with Business 312, and today we're going to go over Chapter 5, which is Consumer Markets and Their Buying Behavior. I think this is a really fun chapter, and I hope that you do too. So let's get started with just going over the overall marketing process. We've gone through Chapters 1 through 4, where we understood the marketplace and consumer needs and wants. We actually... Um, went into designing a customer value driven marketing strategy from the goals all the way to marketing um, and the return on investment from a marketing perspective. We actually went through an overview of the integrated marketing programs and why it's important to engage customers to build profitable relationships. We did a deeper dive in chapter three of consumer um, research and how to actually develop a research plan, a marketing plan, and then actually uh, create the results and then put them into a management information system or a CRM system. And then today, what we're going to be going over is a deeper dive into designing a customer value driven and marketing strategy. And before we start selecting the customer segment and targeting, that customer segment, we really need to get inside of their brains. We really need to understand their needs and wants and desires. Well, how do you do that? Well, it's actually um, a model. And what we're going to be doing is trying to get into our customer's uh, black box. And the intent of all of this, again, is to create products and services that capture value for our customers. And in return, they're going to purchase our products because they find value in it. And they're going to love us so much that we create profits and customer equity. So this chapter has four main concepts. One is to define the um, consumer market and construct a simple model of uh, the consumer bu um, buyer behavior. Two is naming the five major factors that influence consumer buyer behavior. Three is defining the major types of buying decision behavior and the stages that someone goes through. And then four is describing the adoption process for new products and how people buy new products and their behavior through that process. So today we're going to go over um, another product of Louis Vuitton. And again, um, Louis Vuitton is a great product. We know that customers love them. We know that they survive even the craziest of economic downturns. And so why do people purchase Louis Vuitton products? especially a purse that could potentially be costing $150, and they'll pay up to $2,350 of it. Well, this is called the Louis Vuitton Alma PM Monogram Vernice Bag. This is a patent leather bag with the Louis Vuitton ingrained in it or monogrammed in it, and only when you turn it can you actually see the monogram. If you didn't know about Louis Vuitton purses, you wouldn't know that it is a Louis Vuitton unless you know the style and unless you look at it in a certain light. So why would a consumer want to purchase a product that other people wouldn't know? Well, the thing is that you, um, you actually get prestige and esteem from carrying a product that only you know that I know that you know what this is. Um, so from that perspective, let's take a little deep dive into how this all works. Our customer is going to be this, uh, this woman who has prestige in life. They're um, going up the ladder um, from their educational standpoint. Now they have a great career going. Uh, they're becoming executives, directors, um, presidents of companies. And they're really, really engaged in social activities, especially community activities. So this is the um, Hawaii Junior League, um, and they're really involved in helping um, the homeless or helping women that are trafficked, etc. And a lot of them um, are really also developing their careers. So every single one of us um, that's in this group actually needs a purse. So what purse do you purchase and why? That's what we're going to be going into um, in this uh, chapter. So there is a model for consumer buying behavior. And what this model states is that there's three steps to it. The main step is this buyer's black box. It's the characteristics and the decision buying process that uh, any particular buyer is going to go through. 
So how do you actually get into that black box? Or in our case, this young um, executive uh, that needs a purse, um, but is trying to decide which one they want. Well, the first thing that you do is you try to understand their environment. You're going to actually stimulate them through placing of your four P's, your product, your price, your place and promotions. But there's other things that are impacting that black box, which is where um, they are from an economic standpoint. Uh, how do they um, actually interact with technology, their social status and their cultural needs? So from that perspective, we're going to use the environment to create a buyer response so that they purchase the Louis Vuitton purse. So you actually have to really get them to prefer your product and have attitudes towards your product in such a way that they purchase you and that they actually demand your product and that they engage with it and that they build the relationships with the product and um, the status of your product. So in a, at the end of the day, the only thing that really matters is not that you have great marketing and that people know your brand, but they're actually going to put dollars towards it, which is, again, called demand. So let's go into a little bit deeper of that black box. So the black box is actually four major factors, and you're really going to have to know these because there's a target here, and it's going to be in the exam and in the quizzes. So the first major factor is cultural. From a cultural perspective, women need a purse. We need to actually carry our stuff. Um, so from that perspective, women have been brought up that a purse is needed. As a matter of fact, many of us got our first purse at one, two, or three years old. Some of us also carry backpacks or laptop bags now. And again, that's based off of subculture or even social classes. So. The social part of your black box is that you're associated with groups and social networks and family. And your role and status in that social network is also going to impact your black box. So the type of purse or backpack or laptop bag that you purchase says a lot about not only your cultural needs, but your social status. Then you've got your personal and psychological needs. So everybody's got an individual perspective of what they want to carry. So your age and your lifestyle, your occupation, your economic status, all those are your personal needs. Your psychological um, needs are what's the motivation behind you buying that purse? What's your perception of carrying any particular product? And what are your beliefs and attitudes? All of this to make up that buyer's black box. And at the end will impact whether they're going to purchase your product or not. So let's take a little deeper dive into each one. So cultural factors. Again, cultural factors are learned um, aspects from a member of society uh, and your family. Subcultures are um, shared values and common life experiences. So many of us may have been born in other countries or other places in the United States, but now we're living here in Hawaii, so we have a subculture as well. Your social class is um, how society orders you into different divisions. So it's similar to values, interests, and behaviors, and it's made up of occupation, income, education, wealth, and variables. So from that perspective, let's take a look at these women. They are 35 to 45 females. They're married or single. They have one um, more ch uh, children. From a cultural standpoint, they need a purse, but they're focused on esteem. They're going up the ladder. Um, their social status, they have many occupations. Their income is usually over 75000 a year. They're college graduates. They're upper and middle class females. And then we're going to take a look at something called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And so once we go into a deeper dive into that, we'll realize that they're looking for esteem and self-actualization. So they're ready to buy a Louis Vuitton purse because that will make them feel like that they're part of this um, brand or part of this image that they want to actually uh, get people to perceive about them. Social factors are super critical. Again, uh, who you're a member of, who you aspire to be a member of, and who your reference groups are super critical. They all develop your attitudes and behaviors towards a certain product. So with Louis Vuitton, 
it's more of an aspirational product. Um, and so they're going to use these aspirational models and images to attract this premier uh, market group um, who they're targeting. So they're going to actually focus on social networks and groups such as online social networks, buzz marketing, social media sites, and word of mouth and opinion leaders. One of the greatest opinion leaders that we have right now is YouTube. YouTube actually has all these women. Um, when you actually do a search on Google for this Louis Vuitton PM purse, after Louis Vuitton coming in as an ad, these come in and these people are what's called opinion leaders. And it's using social media um, sites such as um, YouTube to get buzz marketing out there. Everything from comparing the purse to actually how I pack my bag and what it feels like to open up the Louis Vuitton bag for the first time. So it's all visual marketing and believe it or not, these women are getting paid to post these um, YouTube ads um, to get you to purchase these. So every brand has a trait or a personality which we either are associated with right now or that we want to be perceived as. Some brands are all about sincerity. Others are about excitement, such as Nike. Some are about confidence, um, such as like IBM. Others are about sophistication, feeling like you're on top of the world and you're sophisticated and you're modern. And other ones are about ruggedness. So the Louis Vuitton bag is really focused on sophistication. And that's the personality that these women that are purchasing these bags are wanting to um, be perceived as. Psychological factors um, that impact the buying um, decision are also the motive. Why do you want to um, purchase this? Well, some of us need a purse uh, and some of us want a Louis Vuitton bag. So there's a motive and a drive. Usually it's a need for something, but the decision of choosing one brand versus the other or one product versus the other is that want. There's motivational research that kind of probes into people's hidden subconscious motivations, which is really getting into that black box. And as a matter of fact, many companies have team of psychologists, anthropologists, and other social scientists to carry out motivational research. Many, many ad agencies routinely conduct one-on-ones and therapy-like interviews to really dive deep into that person's black box. So Louis Vuitton is no different from those um, groups. They have um, motivational psychologists and anthropologists and social scientists that work with them getting into that black box of that target consumer. Other companies ask consumers to describe their favorite brands, such as animals or cars, such as Mercedes versus a Chevy. Others use uh, hypnosis, dream therapy, and a lot of different murky um, depths of, of the consumer psyche. So all these psychological factors really do impact that buying behavior. One of the most interesting ways of understanding people's needs is something called the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I actually use this a lot more than just in marketing, but just an overall understanding of people as a whole. So where you are in the buying decision process is usually associated to where you are in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So take, for instance, the woman that we saw before, the woman that is um, going up the ladder, is an executive, is focused on social needs versus maybe their own family needs. They have children, but maybe they're a little bit older. So where are they? From a psychological need perspective, they're not hungry or thirsty, so they wouldn't be in the psychological need standpoint. So that would mean that they're probably not, um, if you were in that um sphere, you probably wouldn't be looking at purchasing a Louis Vuitton. If you're in the next sphere, which is safety needs, where you're looking for security and protection, which is a house um, insurance, uh, you would be uh, in the um, bottom two uh, aspects of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and you probably aren't looking to buy a Louis Vuitton at that, uh, at that standpoint either. When you're, now that you have a home and you have a job and you're feeling pretty secure, 
you're then looking for um, social needs, a sense of belonging and love. That's when you get married, have children, uh, potentially join groups um, such as the um, that group that the women are joining in where they're helping society. And then from there, uh, you actually get into esteem needs. You actually get into wanting to be recognized, have status and self-esteem. And then the last higher um, level of hierarchy is self-actualization. When you move from yourself and you actually start developing yourself and realizing that there's a larger community. So from that standpoint, my thought is that for a Louis Vuitton, that you're actually right here. You're in the self-esteem, recognition, and status um, level, and you're actually looking for a sense of belonging and love. A woman that has a Louis Vuitton can be in the self-actualization part, but for the most part, um, they might buy a Louis Vuitton if they're triggered by something else, which is not necessarily status, but maybe there's a promotion that gives 20% of the revenues over to um, a social uh, group that they're really interested in. So from that standpoint, the way that we target people in esteem needs, it's going to be different than we target people in self-actualization needs. So taking a deeper dive into psychological factors, belief is super critical. It's what a person understands from everything that they've gained up to um, the point that they are at today, their opinions, and their faith. Their attitudes are relatively consistent with how they feel towards things and how they tend to um, use their knowledge, opinion, and faith towards specific products, specific brands, um, or specific needs. So how do you get the attention of someone when they have specific beliefs and attitudes? especially when people are exposed to 3,000 to 5,000 messages every single day. Can you imagine? That's how much marketing we're getting. So people pay attention to stimuli, but it's hard to get your message across, especially when there's selective attention. And many of you know that you're probably selectively uh, um, putting attention to this presentation and potentially looking at uh, TV or listening to your family. Uh, there's distortive um, selective um, at attention where uh, you aren't really listening at all. And then there's retention where you're actually retaining some of the information that we are actually getting at on a day-to-day -day basis. So again, selective atten um, attention is um, the tendency for people to screen out most of the information that they're exposed to. Selective distortion is for um, the tendency for people to interpret information in the way that they want or they believe. And then uh, selective retention is a tendency to remember good points made about a brand that they like. So psychological factors. So learning is a psychological factor and it is the change in somebody's behavior arising from an experience through the, an interplay of stimuli, drives, cues, reinforcement. So even though you may be stimulated by a brand, you need to be constantly given cues. So that's why Facebook has a lot of um, ads that are tied to things that you look at on the internet. That's because Google and Facebook are reinforcing each other. And I'm sure that Google's paying to be on Facebook. And so Louis Vuitton, if you're looking at a Louis Vuitton ad on Google, it will more than likely that ad will um, show up on your Facebook account. So reinforcement is super critical. So here is a stimuli of Jennifer Lopez looking glamorous with a Louis Vuitton bag. So that could be someone um, that sees this and they're stimulated because it ties to how their black box works and their beliefs and their Maslow hierarchy of needs. If I am just needing food, this isn't going to attract me. If I'm looking for a purse and I want to feel glamorous, this is absolutely going to attract me. All right, so let's take a look at objective three, which is listing and defining the business decision behavior. So now we know how to get into people's black box, 
But how do they make buying decisions? Because at the end of the day, we want them to use their dollars to purchase our products and brands. So this is a, a, a type of buying behavior matrix, which has on one matrix, um, the significant differences between a brand or having few differences between a brand and how involved you need to be with that brand in order to buy it, or if there's low involvement. So let's take a look at each. So a brand that needs um, high involvement and there's significant differences between those brands. It's something like a complex behavior. And this would be di um, displayed when we're purchasing a car. There's obviously different types of cars. Um, you have to be highly involved in, in defining what the car you want. So that is that complex behavior. The next one is low involvement and significant differences between brands. For example, apples. We go to the grocery store. There's a lot of Apple brands out there, but we're just going to go um, be focused on the variety. Um, so we're going to focus on the different types of apples and then the visual cues that we get at the grocery store. But there's not a lot of involvement as far as me having to do a lot of research or actually having to go to five different stores or trying five different apples to purchase that. When there's few differences between brands and there's high involvement, this is called um, dissonance reducing buying behavior, meaning that you're trying to re um, reduce your options and trying to figure out what you want to purchase. Things like that would be like purchasing a house. We don't really know that house A is this brand or house B is this brand. So brands aren't really what we're looking at. What we're looking at differences in that particular product versus the brand. Then we got habitual buying behavior, which is few differences between brands because toothpaste is toothpaste and very low involvement. A lot of us will just buy the toothpaste that's uh, lowest uh, or has the highest coupon price, or we just buy the same brand over and over again. So that's a habitual buying behavior. So let's take a little deeper dive into the overall buying decision process. And again, um, it's five steps and you'll need to know this. So going back, there's four um, different types of buying behavior. And then there's five decision steps. The first step is really understanding that you need something. So for example, let's say that we need a car. And sometimes we don't really need a car, but we're stimulated by an ad. So we may be stimulated by this ad of this beautiful Mercedes. So from there, we start looking at online information about Mercedes. And then we also see that there's Audis and there's different types of Mercedes that we might have. And we also identified that this particular car is about $200,000. So then we start looking at something that might be more in our price range. So we evaluate what's out there. And then we make a final decision on what we purchase. And at the end of the day, after talking to my husband and after talking to my son, we really don't need a convertible. But we do like the Mercedes because after all the research that we did, we like the safety aspects of it. And Mercedes had a great deal on an SUV and my son can put the surfboard on top. So at the end of the day, we purchased the Mercedes SUV. And then the post purchase behavior, that's basically everything that happens after I purchase. So how I'm treated after um, I go in for my first oil change, or if I have an issue and I go in and um, I need to get my tires fixed. All of that is that post um, behavior that really will impact not just this particular buying purchase, but my next one, because we obviously are going to buy at least four cars during our, our life cycle. So if we get a great experience throughout these five steps, we'll more than likely purchase that same Mercedes or maybe a different um, model in the future. So let's now go into the adoption process of new products. So that uh, previously we just kind of walked through the overall purchase process, but what happens when it's a new product that we may not be familiar with? So again, we're gonna use the Louis Vuitton because 
as I think about it myself, I wasn't exposed to Louis Vuitton and potentially you weren't either until we got ads or until we saw people that we admired using those um, products. So I actually followed um, Jennifer Lopez from when she was a dancer and her first albums. So now seeing her, you know, many years later and carrying a Louis Vuitton, I'm aware of her. I see that she looks different than she did when she first started out. She looks um, really elegant and that's a pretty cool bag. And so now I'm aware not only of the Louis Vuitton, but I'm aware of it because of Jennifer Lopez and what I've been following her brand over the years. So as she evolves, um, she also targets my um, black box. So, so then, you know, I start looking at what she purchased and then I start um, creating interest and evaluating. And this is where YouTube comes into place or social media. And then I might go into a trial phase. I might start off not necessarily buying this really expensive purse, but I might start off with a Louis Vuitton wallet, which is only $595. And I start off with that and I try it and I really love it. So when I try it, then I get exposed to this Louis Vuitton PM bag. And again, um, I realize after really understanding the Louis Vuitton brand that it's not so cool to show um, this monogram. That's like the beginner uh, brand. But it's really cool to have the um, purses that you can only see in certain lights. So I then become an adopter of the new um, product lines of this particular brand. So again, it goes from awareness through interest and evaluation through trial of their products. And maybe it's even the beginning trial of, um, of, of products that aren't so expensive and then adopting it and just going full force ahead of new products that they come out with. This is a um, adoption curve or um, kind of explains how that overall process works. So innovators, which are usually the people that don't have to go through this trial period, but just go and adopt a product spot um, on, are very interesting because they are usually the ones that will buy a product before it goes on sale. They wanna be the first ones to have it. And they're also part of the early adopters. And so again, um, early adopters are those that just love the Louis Vuitton brand and just will buy whatever product comes out. Um, and it doesn't really matter what it is. They just wanna be the first ones to have it. Then you got the people that, you know, maybe a year later or so, um, it's about 30% of the overall population that they'll purchase this Louis Vuitton bag, um, but not after they actually see others using it. You got people who are in late mainstream that will purchase the Louis Vuitton bag, or they might be a lagging adopter, but they do it when it's really on sale. So they might buy it from eBay or Tradesy, um, and they buy it at almost $1,000 off. Um, so this could be the same model for cell phones, uh, for TVs, um, et cetera. But just make sure that you understand this model and how this model works and all the steps in, involved with it. Here is a little bit more of a deeper dive. Um, and innovators are venturesome and they're risk takers. Early adopters are guided by respect. That's why they're wanting to purchase those bags or those cell phones or those TVs early on, they're opinion leaders. The early uh, mainstream is deliberate. Although they're rarely leaders, they adopt new ideas before the average person. And the late mainstream is skeptical. So my mom and dad, they bought the iPhone, but not until like three or four years into uh, the newest iPhone until they made sure that it was actually something that they could use and it was tested. Then you got your lagging adopters that are traditional bound. They're suspicious of changes, but they still want good things, um, but they'll buy it at a discounted price. So this is the adopter classification process. And you just really need to understand that, especially when you're um, marketing products. So that's the end of our chapter. And I hope you um, really enjoyed going through a person's black box and how um, they uh, that black box is actually the behavior that they exhibit through a buying model. 
Um, we went through the Haslow hierarchy of needs and how that works in a buying decision, especially with the Louis Vuitton purse. We walk through the overall buying process and then the all overall buying process for new products. And from there, um, we have the next chapters, which you need to complete all the chapter work um, for uh, chapter five, as well as the ethics discussions um, for week two. And don't forget to complete um, chapter six and seven. Again, thank you so much and mahalo until the next video.